Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Way Refuel, where I cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 28th of July, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So we have the official girly slash Prada merge announcement today. So Prada, which is the, uh, I guess, proof of stake chain that girly is going to be merging with, will run through the Bellatrix upgrade on August 4th and merge with girly between August 6th and August 12th. It's a wide window there, um, but basically, obviously, it's based on TDD. Uh, if you run a node or validator, this is your last chance to go through the process before mainnet. So as you guys know, girly will be the last public test net to go through the merge transition before we do it on mainnet you can read this kind of announcement post for full, full details here along with client releases for both the consensus and execution layers with an FAQ as well to remind you of basically what you will need to do for the kind of test net and what you'll also be, need, be needing to do on mainnet as well. As I mentioned before, that there is that merge readiness checklist. Make sure that you're familiar with that. Make sure that if you're a solo staker, you are upgrading your kind of like nodes and your validators and you're, and you're kind of like doing the other things on that list, such as optionally running uh, MEV boost if you want to take advantage of that, but also doing things... Uh, doing the other things on that list as well. And there's a reminder in this kind of uh, blog post that you can check out too, but you can go check that out. Uh, and yeah, as I mentioned, the clients are out there uh, too. So the, the Geth kind of like um, release is here as well. So this configures the merge TTD on the girly testnet and fixes a few regressions. So very cool to see the, I guess, quote unquote official announcement. We already knew it was coming at this date, uh, but yeah, it's kind of like being, uh, being confirmed here. As I said, last public testnet to run through the transition. I mean, I feel like at, at this point, we're just running through the motions, guys. Guys, like it's, I think girly is just a formality at this point. I think we're pretty much ready to merge mainnet. We just got to go through girly and then uh, obviously get to September and do the mainnet merge, hopefully in the week of September 19th. I don't see any reason for it to be pushed back at this point in time. Like, honestly, I mean, I, I've got a kind of like an update here about the Shadow Fork 10, which is mainnet Shadow Fork 10. Everything seemed to go very, very well. You can see here this update comes from Parathos where he said they didn't notice any client incompatibilities with the transition, which was awesome. I mean, we we sometimes see this, right, with these kind of like Shadow Forks or a lot of the time see this, but we didn't see it on mainnet Shadow Fork 10. Uh, some base nodes are running the older version and needed an update resync that it explained almost all of the missing participants rate the node should be done resyncing soon the participation rate should go back up we noticed lodestar aragon pair having trouble fetching a block but this is most likely attributed to the shadow fork peering setup rather than a real issue so again bunch of non-merge related issues uh i guess like only a couple there which is amazing i mean the fact that there's no client incompatibilities with the transition at all between all of the kind of uh, production ready uh, clients on the execution and consensus layer side is awesome. I think, I don't know the date for mainnet Shadow Fork 11 yet, but I'm, sh I'm sure it's going to be coming soon. But I mean, at this point, it's just kind of like, we know what to do. We've done it so many times. It, it works well. We know <clears throat> what can go wrong, how to recover from things that go wrong, like a drop in participation rate due to configuration issues. We know how quickly that we can recover from them on test nets, probably going to be quicker on mainnet because there's real value you at stake uh no pun intended or pun intended uh, uh and then uh yeah i think that it's all pretty much kind of like tested out at this point I, 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 as i said formalities from now i don't think the testing that we're doing now is really anything than kind of like I guess like triple checking, quadruple checking, quintuple checking our work essentially. And Girly will be that final public test net and then we'll move on to the main net. So very, very cool to to see that. All right, so I saw a bit of discussion today on Twitter around something related to the merge. And I basically put a tweet out where I said, you know, I'm seeing influencers and miners shilling a possible Ethereum proof of work fork today. Now people are free to fork Ethereum at the time of the merge and continue it as a proof of work chain, but basically everything on that chain will break, especially DeFi. But hey, I won't say no to dumping proof of work ETH for more ETH. Now the reason why people were talking about this is because uh, I can't I, I, I can't remember his, na his name. I think his name is Chan Le Guo, or uh, he's basically a, a big miner was responsible for or a big part of the Ethereum Classic fork. Announced today on Twitter that they're planning to do a kind of like PAL only fork uh, of Ethereum. You know, once the merge happens. I've talked about this on the refill before. I've talked about it for a long time, actually. And I've mentioned that I believe that there was a high chance this would happen because uh, there's money to be made, right? Look, you, you might think to yourself, well, who's going to be buying the forked kind of like ETH tokens here? Who's going to be buying the proof of work fork ETH tokens? Look, guys, I don't know how long you've been around for, but these markets can be really dumb and not just dumb. If there is enough people kind of buying into this narrative, buying into the trade, then you're going to have the speculators, you're going to have the everyday traders jumping into this as well, which just adds more liquidity, adds more 
kind of like buy pressure. And uh, yeah, this thing could uh, obtain some kind of value, right? But the thing is, is that this isn't like a Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash fork from 2017. That was uh, definitely an ideology thing. This is more of a kind of like, let's see if we can get free money thing. Uh, and also Bitcoin is very, very different to Ethereum in, in kind of like forking. When, when Bitcoin cash forked off, you know, you, instead of BTC on Bitcoin cash, you have BC, BCH and that was really it. There was nothing else that needed to be kind of like worried about. But when you fork Ethereum, you have to worry about basically everything else on the chain. Now, let me use a clear example here. For DeFi, the clearest example I can use to illustrate my point is stable coins, right? Within kind of like DeFi, even just stable coins in general. If you have the Ethereum proof of stake chain, which is the canonical chain, it's the one that we're all using. It's the one that everyone agrees is the real Ethereum. And then you have this proof of work chain that has uh, basically everything Ethereum had before it merged to proof of stake. Well, the stable coins on that proof of work chain logically are going to go to zero, like especially the centralized ones, because Circle and Coinbase, the issuer of USDC, are not going to honor the USDC tokens on the proof of work Ethereum chain. They're going to honor them on the proof of stake Ethereum chain. So say there's like $50 billion of USDC in circulation. There's only $50 billion in cash backing that up. There's not $100 billion. So they can't basically cover their, I guess, like IOU, so to speak, on the proof of work Ethereum chain, which means that USDC on that chain should logically trade at zero because it's, it's, it's worthless, right? Same goes for Tether. Same goes for any centralized stablecoin. The decentralized stablecoins get a bit murky. I mean, if you talk about something like DAI, the ETH backing the DAI would be worth, would be the proof of work ETH, right? Would be worth a lot less than real ETH. It would be worth whatever the speculators are kind of like making it worth at the time. Same goes for all of the tokens out there. So it's not like when the fork happens, uh, you're going to be able to get I guess like all these free money, you're going to like double your money. No, that's not how it works at all. You might get a, like a, 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 a fraction of what you get for your real tokens, right? For example, maybe you get 10% of the value. I mean, I don't even think you'll get that to be honest. Like maybe uh, depending on how much hype there is around this, depending on how much speculation there is around it, this, it's just, it's impossible to tell. But the proof of work Ethereum chain, everything's going to break on there. There's going to be no oracles uh, supporting it either because the oracles are, are kind of like set up to support the Ethereum proof of stake chain post-merge, right? Because that is the canonical chain. Um, and there's going to be a lot of people kind of like selling into these liquidity pools and trying to get out. There's going to be a shit ton of MEV happening as well on the chain. Like, honestly, it's going to be like, you, you know that the whole thing's going to blow up, but there's going to be so many people probably trying to get out, right? And get the money out and try and make money and try and dump all their tokens as fast as possible that the MEV stuff is going to be incredibly lucrative and it's going to, you know, jump up a lot of attention. And there's going to be a lot of speculation around this. So I do want to give fair warning here is that there, as, I, as I've said before, there is a high chance of this happening but it doesn't mean that this chain is worth anything or is legit. It just means that the speculators trying to make money or what they perceive to be free money. It's kind of like how Ethereum Classic has gone up in value over the last few weeks because there's some a narrative around it that, oh, all the miners are going to move to Ethereum Classic and then people are going to use Ethereum Classic or whatever, like some, some bizarre things that I'm seeing. It's like, okay, well, no, that's just people pushing this narrative because they want to uh, trade it leading up to kind of like the merge. And they want to make money. And, you know, so far it's, it's worked, I guess, for people who are trading this. But traders and investors, as I've discussed before, very, very different timelines, very, very different sets of people. And also I want to say when, if this fork was to happen, it's, it's similar to kind of like the Ethereum Classic fork. It's not like you're going to get airdropped to the proof of work ETH tokens on your main Ethereum wallet on, on proof of stake Ethereum. That's not how it works at all. The proof of work chain is a completely separate chain. It has nothing to do with the Ethereum chain that's going to be proof of stake, right? The canonical chain. So you would have to, as you do with basically layer twos and other, net, other EVM networks, you would have to change your network in MetaMask and you would want to make sure that you're on the right network as well. You want to make sure that you can actually push transactions through. That's another thing as well. Like if Infura or Alchemy or any of these service providers don't have a way for you to push transactions through because they don't have the node set up for it, then you're, you're going to probably have to run your own local node to do that. And as I said, the MEV people are going to take full advantage of this because they know exactly what they're doing. And it's going to be quite wild to watch play out. But essentially, if you want to access, access those forked coins, you would have to change the network and then your balances would change to what you have on, uh, I guess, like the Ethereum power fork. And obviously the dollar value of those coins would be worth a lot less than it would be for the real coins on, on Ethereum. So yeah, it's, it's going to be messy if it does happen. As I said, I think there's a high chance that it happens just because there's money to be made here for the people that want to make it happen, but it's going to be a completely worthless and, and, and kind of like irrelevant chain. Uh, it's not going to basically have any activity on it. I doubt any developers or applications are really going to, um, 
uh, embrace it, especially the major ones. And it's going to hurt a lot of people because people are not going to understand what they're doing. The MEV people are going to understand what they're doing. They're going to extract so much value. The people that are that kind of like know that every, that basically everything on that chain is going to zero are going to get out first, right? Even if it pumps up a little bit, like this is a, 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 something I think a lot of people miss is that say the kind of like fork happens and then the ETH on the proof of work chain is worth $10. I'm just throwing out a random kind of figure there. And then you sell it all at 10 bucks and then it goes to 20 bucks because of some speculation. Like that doesn't mean anything. Like ETC did the same thing after the fork. And that was actually a, a completely different fork, mind you. It was based on an ideological thing, kind of like the Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash fork. Um, but just because it's gone up in value doesn't mean it's going to stay there. Like once the speculation and hype phase is over, it's going to just trend to zero. Like look at Bitcoin cash against Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Like not against USD, but again, I mean, even against USD, it's pretty wrecked, but against Bitcoin, it's just like obliterated. Same with all the other forks, like Bitcoin SV, Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Diamond. They were all just, I mean, I think Bitcoin Gold and Diamond are basically scams, uh, but basically they're all just kind of like sold off to get the real tokens because no one cares about these things. They want to stack BTC. They would want to stack ETH, right? So if this, if this happens, I'm 100%, like I'm going to be completely transparent here. I'm selling everything that I get the, the, the day that I get it and for more ETH. Like, as I said, I'm not going to say no to free ETH just because some people wanted to make more money here. And at the end of the day, if people are buying this and speculating on it, that's not my fault. Like, I'm, I, as I've said before, I'm giving warnings. I'm telling people that the chain is going to blow up. Like, this is not going to be a good thing for anyone. Um, but the thing is, if I can stack more ETH with it, then so be it. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys would take advantage of this as well. But I, as I said, I do want to warn that it is not just a clear cut thing. Like you're going to uh, have to kind of like uh, consider the fact that you, you you basically have to have some way to relay your transactions, uh, whether that be through a third party or, on, or your own node. Um, and you'll have to also have to consider the MEV consequences, the fact that everything's going to blow up, you know, all that sorts of stuff. In saying that as well, I do want to note that it's not going to affect anything on the main Ethereum chain, uh, on the on you know the canonical chain. Uh, that's all going to be well and good. All the value of your tokens will be what they are. I mean, they'll be obviously based on the market price, but that's the real kind of like tokens, right? And DeFi will continue to work fine. So I, that's kind of like a, a note there because I know some people might be thinking, oh my god, you know what's going to happen to my stuff if there is a fork and. It's contentious and all these sorts of stuff. Well, I mean, nothing really. And also on top of that, because they're two different consensus uh, mechanisms, right? One's proof of work, one's proof of stake. There's no hash wars. I remember I went in the Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash war, uh, there was a hash war where miners would just keep changing between the two chains. That can't happen with with this because obviously they're two completely different things, right? So that's another thing to bear in mind. So nothing to stress about. Maybe you'll make some free money. Maybe you won't if this happens. Uh, but do keep in mind that it's not just a clear cut thing. There are consequences for these sorts of things. And uh, and, and kind of like depending on what you do on the, on the fork chain, right? Um, if you're going to speculate, if you're actually going to buy, like selling is fine. But if you're actually going to buy these things, just be kind of like, uh, just completely understand the fact that it's pure speculation. You're not actually buying anything based on fundamentals. You're buying it all based on speculation. And, and you're allowed to do that. Don't get me wrong. Like feel free to do that. But I think I just want to kind of like put that warning out there that uh, it, 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 it may not end well, right? Like there's no guarantee you're going to make money from that. But yeah, anyway, leave it at that for today. Uh, let's go on to the next update. So uh, here, I, I saw this interesting tweet from Kion, who's the co-founder of Monad here, um, where he, he said, Lot, uh, lots of EVM FUD on the timeline lately. And there has been, right? Like everyone loves to hate on the EVM, loves to hate on Solidity, all that sorts of stuff. Uh, but then Kion kind of continues and, say, and says, EVM is a powerful bytecode standard that has stood the test of time, will continue to evolve with new opcodes and feats, has multi, uh, multiple great high leverage languages such as Solidity and Viper, and will get much more performance. And they're working on that at Monad. So if you don't know what Monad is, it's basically a, a kind of a team that's accelerating the EVM ecosystem for world adoption. That's what they're saying here. I'm going to follow that account now. Uh, but yeah, guys, like I, I've talked about the EVM dominance before. I mean, I think I talked about it recently, so I'm not going to get too kind of like um, into the weeds here. But like... I think we really need to encourage people to, or not encourage, but like make people aware of the fact that the EVM is going nowhere. Solidity is going nowhere. It's going to keep growing. It's going to keep dominating. Even the people and the ecosystem that say that the EVM is shit and Solidity is shit, they have their own EVM chains. I mean, it's just hilarious whenever I see that because the EVM has such a large network effect that it actually makes sense for them to do that. So it's easy for apps to port over and all that sorts of stuff. So yeah, whenever you see EVM FUD or anything like that, just know that it's actually FUD. And yeah, okay, the EVM is and perfect, but it can be improved over time. And it has such an, a, a large network effect that it's worth improving it. Like it's very worth improving it. 
And as I've said before, we we're on layer two, we're going to have the EVM compatible and equivalent stuff, but we're also going to have other ecosystems like Starknet that aren't EVM at all. And there's going to be other layer twos that also aren't EVM and that have their own virtual machine, their own languages, and that's fine. But I guess you can have that and not fight the EVM at the same time, right? So yeah, just want to mention that. Uh, I think there's a couple more tweets here and some discussion in the thread. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to check out. All right, so speaking of, I guess, like languages, there is this new language that was released today called Huff, which is, uh, I guess, claiming to be the most gas-optimized smart contract language to ever touch the EVM. Huff enables you to optimize your contracts by up to 80% compared to other languages like Solidity and Viper. Very cool for the developers out there. Like, as I said, guys, the EVM is just going to keep getting better and better. Now we have another new language for this based on kind of like gas optimizations. You may think to yourself, well, why do we need gas optimizations if we're moving to layer twos? It's the same thing, right? Layer twos, EVM compatible and equivalent layer twos still use the concept of gas. So anything we can do to reduce those costs there uh, at the smart contract uh, uh, language level, we're just going to just reduce the overall cost of those layer two transactions and get them like really, really, really cheap. So very, very cool to see. This. I think this is made by the uh, someone at Aztec Protocol, one of the co-founders of Aztec Protocol, which is really cool to see. Um, but yeah, if you're a developer and you want to learn more about this and kind of like how you can get involved and how you can start using it, you can go to huff.sh. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess like for non-developers out there, it's probably not interesting to you, but I thought it was worth mentioning in the context of the EVM stuff that I just talked about. All right, so uh, this came out yesterday and I didn't see it until after I recorded yesterday's refuel, but basically another update here from Rocket Pool on their Redstone, uh, I guess like protocol upgrade that is coming. So this uh, update is called the Merge and Node Operators. And basically what it does is it goes through how things are changing for, I guess, Rocket Pool uh, Node Operators here. So you can read the full blog post for what's changing on Rocket Pool side. There's actually a lot of changes and I've, I think I've gone through this before. There's naming changes, changes with the engine API, which is actually on the Ethereum protocol side. Uh, fee recipient. So that's again on the Ethereum protocol side, but you're going to need to set your fee recipient uh, if you're a solo validator or if you're kind of like a rocket pool validator, a node operator here. MEV boost, as I mentioned before, it's an optional extra, but definitely something you want to take advantage of. And then there are other sections, you know, how do I prepare for the merge uh, and kind of uh, some things that are rocket pool related as well here. So if you uh, fall into that camp, definitely kind of check out this blog post for the details. I like this little graphic that they have here basically showing us kind of like where we uh, where we kind of like uh, moving to with the merge and kind of like how it relates to rocket pool down the bottom here so yeah i mean this is uh, kind of like similar i guess little graphic uh, i guess like compared to what trent van epps has put out prior i think i've showed that on the refill before many times actually uh, and there's kind of like a little timeline here as well which is very very cool so yeah, just more merge related stuff this time got to do with rocket pool which you guys know i love uh and also speaking of rocket pool there's another update here that a thousand eth was deposited today in in rocket pool which is very cool to see and i didn't even know this website existed but there's a website called rocketscan.io which i guess is the rocket pool kind of explorer here this is really cool i didn't i as i said i didn't know this existed i don't know how i hadn't seen this before but it has all kinds of metrics and stats and kind of like different kind of things you can keep uh, uh keep track of here which i think is very very cool and on this page, it basically shows the deposit pool and you can kind of see uh, uh, the kind of like 1,000 ETH that was deposited here into the Rocket Pool protocol. Uh, I think this is going to keep growing, guys. Like, I mean, Rocket Pool is making those big uh, kind of upgrades that I've talked about before. They're lowering the barrier to entry for people. Uh, I think more and more people are learning about it through the bankless kind of like ads that they're doing. Obviously, I talk about it on the refill a lot too. Uh, but yeah, I'm loving the fact that Rocket Pool is just getting more and more usage here. And I was actually looking at um, Lido's dominance uh, just before on Hill Dobby's, uh, Hill Dobby's uh, Dune Analytics dashboard. And I'll bring it up over here for you guys so you can see what I mean. But Lido's market share was what, 33.5, almost 34% or something like that. And as I said before, its market share can't actually go down um, uh, from kind of like with uh, people withdrawing out of Lido because the ETH is still staked on the beacon chain because there's not withdrawals uh, available. But their market share can go down if other validators or if other kind of like services come online to dilute their market share. So Lido's market share is down to 31.4% now. So it's dropped by about 2 Two two point five percent, which is which is cool to see. Obviously, a slower drop because, as I said, people can't withdraw out of Lido directly. But like, we want to get this down as much as possible. Rocket Pool is obviously working on it. There's a bunch, yeah, you know, so many people doing staking these days. I mean, not just kind of like these LSDs or liquid staking derivatives, but also the exchanges and other services and things like that as well. So that's cool. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of I always get into this debate with people about kind of like what this number is going to look like. This uh, I guess like staked through Lido number is going to look like uh, once withdrawals are enabled. And I, I do firmly believe 
that people are going to reshuffle their stake. I, I know I've said it, and I know I'm going to probably keep saying it until withdrawals are enabled. But you know, as I said, there's only two ways for the market share to go down. And they could probably have a double whammy where the market share gets withdrawn from Lido, but at the same time, a lot of more people are staking their ETH and they're not going through Lido. They're going through another provider such as Rockapool, which would be very cool. Obviously, I don't want Rockapool to just replace Lido and then we just kind of got the, you know, hey, it's the new boss, same as the old boss sort of thing going on. I do want a very distributed kind of like uh, beacon chain um, and a very decentralized beacon chain. You can see here what the kind of like breakdown lo looks like right now. Lido number one, uh, a kind of like Coinbase, Kraken, Binance uh, have a large share here. Not as big as uh, as kind of like um, uh, as I thought actually, which is which is cool to see. You have an others kind of uh, I guess uh, a category here, and a bunch of other categories as well. So if we can just keep shrinking each of these down uh, like enough, because right now I mean you know you kind of like put Lido, Binance, Kraken, and Coinbase together, it's a pretty hefty kind of like share of the network. I mean that alone is over fifty percent, right? So if you kind of like put them together, not great, but Lido isn't just Lido. It's obviously uh, distributed among kind of different staking providers. I think they have like 28 different staking providers now. Um, so there's that aspect to it as well. But getting each of these down to maybe like... I don't know. I, I want to say we don't want any one entity to have over 10% of, of kind of like the stake, right? It, and I don't think that's actually too hard to achieve. Like it may seem like it's it's difficult to achieve right now. We have two entities over 10%. Coinbase at 14.6%, Lido at 31.3%. But post withdrawals being enabled and more and more competition coming online, more and more staking service providers coming online, I think we can get there. I really do. I know people have a different view on this thinking that, uh, especially people who are bullish on Lido, they have this thesis that it's all just going to centralize within Lido because of liquidity effects and all that sort of stuff. And I actually understand that point of view, don't get me wrong. But I really don't think that it's going to end up like that. I, I think that people who think in the, that kind of like absolute term are, 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 are kind of like a bit short-sighted. I do think that the Ethereum community cares enough about kind of like keeping the beacon chain stake decentralized and distributed. And I also believe that uh, the competition is going to get so fierce that there are going to be different incentives on, you know, for different kind of like providers. And once withdrawals are enabled, people can kind of like stake, restake, do all these sorts of things. I know there's a queue, right? It's not like you can just cop in and out all the time. There is definitely a queue to, to, to stake and unstake. But I don't think that Lido is going to stay at 31.3% dominance, right? I really don't think so. I mean, I think it could be below 30% easily by the time we get to big and chain withdrawals being enabled because, you know, other providers have just gotten more stake within them. Uh, but we'll have to see how that shakes out. But uh, yeah, as I said, I don't think this is something of... Uh, of kind of like long-term concern, but I'm really, really happy that people are still shouting it out and still kind of like making noise about it because at least keeps the awareness up, keeps it on top of people's minds, just like we did with client diversity. I think the client diversity drive proves that we can, we have the muscle to do this and we have the kind of like ability to do this. Obviously, it's not apples to apples because of the fact that um, client diversity and, you know, who you stake with is, is probably two different things, but it just shows that the social layer can enact, you know, grand change when it wants to. And I was looking at this the other day and I posted this in the Discord channel the other day about Coinbase and Kraken, they were using, I think, over 90% Prism at one point. Now they're at like 45% or something. Like that's that's half. Like, and Prism being the majority client, what well, was the majority client, the super majority client, I should say, on the beacon chain. And that changed within a few months. So it really does show the power of the social layer, which I think can definitely be applied to staking. And I hope that the people that have been kind of like shouting from the rooftops about uh, liquid staking derivative centralization, especially around Lido, continue to do so. Um, even if I disagreed with some of the tactics like making Lido self-limit, I, I still disagreed with that tactic. It's obviously not going to happen, um, but that's fine. I think even making noise about it in that context was still good because it made people more aware of the issue and it, it probably got people to, to rethink if they were going to stay with Lido or they're going to stay with a minority provider or something like that. So uh, yeah, as I said, I still think it's important. I still think it's something worth talking about. So kudos to those people that talked about that. All right, so the snapshot for the GHO proposal, which is the kind of like Aave stablecoin here, is now public. You can go check this out on Snapshot. The link will be in the YouTube description below. I think this is going to pass. I don't foresee people voting against this. It seems like a good idea. I don't know if we need another stablecoin, but we'll see. I mean, maybe we do need another decentralized stablecoin to compete because we just uh, kind of like don't have many of those these days. Um, so yeah, if you're kind of like an Aave token holder, you can definitely go vote in this. But even if you're not, you can kind of like just keep tabs on this, keep kind of like, uh, 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 keep a kind of like a pulse on what's happening in the Aave community with regards to this. I'm definitely keeping a, a, a close eye on it. I think the, the ticker should definitely be changed. GHO just 
it, it just doesn't look good as a ticker, especially if it's something like a stable coin, which is obviously going to be used more than a, a regular token. I think they should change the ticker. Maybe they will before it goes live. Um, but that's the only feedback I really have on it. I'm just curious to see how this kind of like, uh, kind of another decentralized stable coin experiment is going to play out. So I'm definitely excited for that. But yeah, just wanted to mention that the snapshot is now live, but I do think that uh, this is going to go through with no uh, kind of um, no drama here. All right, so Jacob Horn here from Zora put out this, I guess, like really important image that I really, really liked where on, it's kind of like a, a spectrum here. On, on the left side of the spectrum, you've got the top kind of uh, label being protocol and then under that saying forkable. And then on the right side of the spectrum, you have brand and then unforkable. And I think this is a very simple way of showing that taking for an example ethereum and the evm very easy to fork it right everyone's done it you know every, people have made money off it there are so many chains out there that have done it at this point it's 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 easily done because it's all open source and it's kind of like a it's kind of like a an everyday thing that people do at this stage and then you have brand which is unforkable just because you fork ethereum and the EVM doesn't mean you've forked the Ethereum brand. Like all you have is the technology. You don't have the brand. You don't become Ethereum just because you forked it, right? And this just goes back to my earlier discussions in the episode about kind of like the proof of work fork, right? You don't get any of the legitimacy that Ethereum has. You don't get any of the social legitimacy. You actually probably get negative legitimacy because people view your chain and like, uh, and kind of like, okay, well, you're just a fork of Ethereum. You're just a fork of Geth. It's kind of like worthless. We have too many of these, you know, who cares about that? Right, you don't get any of the. Com I mean, maybe you get some of the community, maybe, but like most of them don't come over. Uh, maybe you get some liquidity during like a bull market because people want to make money. But really, at the end of the day, like the brand, the Ethereum brand, does not come with you. You're just forking the technology. And even if you have like the EVM, which is obviously stands for the Ethereum Virtual Machine, it doesn't matter because your EVM is not the EVM, like for example. And it doesn't just go for Ethereum; it goes for everything else in in, in crypto, especially Uniswap. How many times has Uniswap been forked? The, uh, the protocol, I should say, sorry. Um, the brand, definitely not. I mean, the funny thing is like we had this massive war between SushiSwap and Uniswap. SushiSwap is basically irrelevant these days. Uniswap is dominating, like absolutely dominating. Then you had PancakeSwap on BSC. Uh, and then you had a bunch of others on other kind of like chains that just forked Uniswap. All of them are very, very small compared to Uniswap. Because Uniswap has that incredible brand, that incredible kind of like awareness around that brand and uh, and kind of like all the goodwill, uh, kind of like all the social legitimacy and all the technical legitimacy as well, right? Like if you fork the code, there are changes you can make to it as well. So even if you fork uh, kind of like Uniswap and you don't change anything, um, there's no there's no kind of like, uh, I guess, like a guarantee that you won't change it in the future. Maybe you added an admin key to it and everything else stay the same. Well, now it's kind of like, okay, well, you might change it. You're not Uniswap at all. You're something completely different now, right? Um, I guess like you're not Uniswap the protocol, obviously not the brand. Uh, it, it goes for everything. I mean, I can give a million examples here, but I think you get the point. And I think this is something that especially kind of like newcomers to crypto completely miss is that they think that because everything's open source, you can just kind of like fork something and take its value away. You No, I mean, maybe temporarily there might be some kind of like war that goes on between a couple of protocols like the Uniswap, SushiSwap thing, but long term, you don't take any value away from the original. The original stays dominant unless it's like, unless the original is, is kind of like crappy already or unless the original kind of like failed already and you think you can do something better. There's not that many examples of these. Obviously, there's been a lot of forks, but the original always seems to win out. I think maybe an example of this might be Steam. What happened with Steam where Justin Sun took it over? And then they kind of like forked off into Hive. I think Hive got all of the Steam users and has much more legitimacy. Um, but in terms of like forks overall, it's usually the original that retains its value and retains its social legitimacy because of that brand, right? Not because of the technology. Um, and, you know, the, the brand kind of like carries the technology. So I, I just thought that was a great graphic and I just wanted to kind of like give my view on it there. I finally here, I just wanted to highlight uh, this kind of tweet from David Hoffman. So this is a list of all of the ETHCC interviews that he did. And this is a pretty stellar list, if I if I may say so myself. So the first episode, I think, is out already, which is uh, the Vitalik episode. But then he has a bunch of different guests on. He's Kane from Synthetics. He has Uri and Eli from Starkware. Uh, Mahalo from Polygon. Uh, I think this is Sunny from uh, from Osmosis, Osmosis, the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, Hastani from Aave, Proven Authority, which uh, I believe is Evan. 
Kevin from Disco, uh, and Awoki and Austin here, Awoki from Gitcoin, and Austin Griffith are from a bunch of different kind of like things within the Ethereum community. He's, he's definitely one of our top builders. But yeah, I mean, I can't wait to listen to all of these. I haven't listened to the Vitalik one yet. Apparently, it's really good, so I'm definitely going to listen to that soon. But uh, yeah, just a killer lineup here. Obviously, all on Bankless. Wanted to highlight it for you guys so you don't miss it. Um, but on that note, I think that's going to be it for today. So thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.